Most of you know that, uh, that I graduated uh, from college uh, with a degree in political science. And um, as one of the, the very last classes I took as, as part of that degree, um, I had a class that was called Bureaucratic Politics and Administrative Law. Riveting stuff. <laughs> I, I actually had no idea uh, then how that class would help me think about um, organizations, um, organizations in general, uh, government, businesses, uh, nonprofits, families, um, and even the church. Uh, and I am going to uh, attempt to dump a semester's worth of bureaucracy into your brain this morning in under two minutes using a video. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but quickly, I want to explain why. Uh, right? why. Why take a little bit of time this morning to learn about some tedious organizational dynamic uh, with a word that I uh, couldn't spell every single time I put it in my, in my stuff this morning. I kept having to like, oh yeah, it's spelled the user in weird places. So why? <laughs> I, I, I want you to recognize how natural and how human it is for us to organize ourselves into some sort of, of functional bureaucracy. Um, you can find examples in all of our lives, um, from the way we organize our families to maybe our larger families to even our life together as a church. Um, but you find examples of it all throughout Scripture, from, from Moses choosing 70 elders uh, to help him judge disputes among the people, um, the creation of priests, uh, in Israel with unique clothes and responsibilities and tasks. Um, even in the New Testament, as the church in Jerusalem distinguishes between the work of the apostles and the administrators of a feeding program, and then on through the New Testament as we find elders and deacons recognizing the value of bureaucracy as a, a way to organize our lives together, um, we can then critique it. And this morning, I want to critique bureaucracy because we don't often think about where it exists in our lives, but I want to critique it in the ways that it keeps us from loving each other and the ways that it keeps us from loving God. And so we're going we're gonna to watch this, uh, this quick video. Hi. I'm Craig, and this is Crash Course Government and Politics, and today we're going to talk about bureaucracies just as soon as I finish filling out these forms. Do I really have to initial here, here, and here on all three copies, Stan? Regulation say so? All right. I'm just kidding. I don't really have to fill out forms in triplicate in order to make an episode of Crash Course. But this kind of stuff is one of the main reasons that people don't like bureaucracies. Americans tend to associate them with incomprehensible rules and time-wasting procedures, and probably most annoying, actual bureaucrats. But bureaucracies are a lot like <laughs> our extended families, in that we largely don't understand, or at least don't appreciate, the important role that bureaucracies play in our lives, mainly because of all the forms, and because my cousin who always ate all the cookies from the jar at Grandma's house. So what exactly is a bureaucracy? I don't like to do this because I'm arrogant and lazy, but sometimes it's helpful to go to a dictionary when you need to find out what a word means. So here's a serviceable political science -y definition. A bureaucracy is a complex structure of offices, tasks, rules, and principles of organization that are employed by all large-scale institutions to coordinate the work of their personnel. Two points to emphasize here. First, bureaucracies are made up of experts who usually know more about the topic at hand than you do and who are able to divide up complex tasks so that they can get done. Second, all large-scale institutions use bureaucracy so the distinction between big business and big government is, in at least this respect, bogus. Or what I like to call a false dichotomy. <laughs> All right, so you should know everything you need to know about bureaucracies at this point. Um, there's, a, there's a single reason why organizations create bureaucracy. Bureaucracy comes with the promise of efficiency. Uh, it doesn't always get there. But, to, but bureaucracy in its purest form is about getting things done. So drawing up a standard floor plan for this room is a bureaucratic act that 
Harold Treebs helped us out with last week. Um, and that, that we, as we all discovered last night, having a standard setting for this room, something to follow, made the work go so much faster when the dinner was over and, where we, and when we knew where everything went. Everyone knew what we were working towards and it simplified the process. It was somewhat efficient. And if you've seen some of our uh, resets previously, it was much more efficient. It was awesome. In bureaucracy, um, you, just, you divide up tasks. You create clear channels for communication. You set policies and procedures and you divvy up resources. Everyone knows their place in the system. You are set to standardize some process so that in the end you do it safer, uh, you do it more quickly, you do it more efficiently. So uh, just in our, in our society, in our culture, this is one of the arguments for having a standing military. There are countries that don't have a standing mil military, we do, but you create this elaborate bureaucracy for training, equipping, sustaining, deploying, reintegrating soldiers and your military readiness skyrockets and the quality of your soldiers is predictably improved and consistent. Uh, this is also one of the reasons why a lot of startup companies never become sustainable because they have a great product and, and maybe they have you know, some dynamic founders um, who have a great idea, but, but if the company can't uh, create some level of bureaucracy that standardizes processes and, and creates dependable supply chains and has community, uh, uh, consistent communication strategy, a, a company won't be able to scale what it does and it gets stuck or it dies. Now, maybe you know somebody who's uh, started a company before. There's a reason why most founders resist some level of the bureaucracy. There's something really dynamic and free and, and personal about the early days of, of starting a new thing. And a bureaucracy formalizes relationships into roles, and relationships often become less personal. And the same goes for the military. We've heard quite a bit uh, in recent years about those who are coming home from combat with PTSD or other injuries from war. And when you've, uh, when you've created a clearly defined set of policies and procedures, there isn't much wiggle room uh, for individuals, for this unique soldier and her distinct needs? Or, or, or what, about, uh, what about this other soldier who might have similar issues but is, is facing challenges unique to him? Uh, but of course, this doesn't just apply to government. Anyone who has Kaiser knows how deeply impersonal uh, public health care can be and can feel. But consider the goal, efficiency. If I can create a phone tree that allows you to call an automated message system to get you where you need to be with a, without a human stepping in, uh, except when it is necessary. I've saved money, I've saved resources, but I've also taken the human connection out of the process. Our, our passage this morning is about human connection. It's about presence. It's about being present. Uh, for all of, of bureaucracy's benefits, it can never replace one human being present with another human being. The, the first time I remember experiencing this truth was probably, it was like 2009, 2010, um, a little fuzzy in my brain, um, but um, our pastor at the time was out on sabbatical. And so um, I was the guy on call for hospital visits. And uh, I got the call that I was not looking forward to um, because Stan Ross, a man that I had never met before, was in his last hours. He was ready to pass away. And so this call came. Could I go and could I pray with him before he passed? The reason I wasn't looking forward to this call is I had never done this before. And I was terrified that when my pastor was on sabbatical that this very thing would happen. I actually couldn't remember the last time I was in a facility like this one. Um, 
when I look, when I think back, it was like when I was a kid and my great grandma was sick. Uh, but that was it. And so I didn't know what to do. And so I call our pastor's wife um, because apparently she, apparently she wasn't on sabbatical or something. I don't, I don't know. But Cindy um, had a ton of uh, hosp- experience in hospitals and, and she had gone to visit Stan before and, and she so graciously went with me. And, and we walk in and Stan is unconscious and he's breathing heavily and Cindy just walks right up to him and she takes, I mean, his frail hand and, and I come alongside her and she prays and, and it was the most like normal and natural prayer you could imagine in that setting. And, and she, would, she would pause as though she were listening and it was just, as, it was beautiful in its genuineness. Um, and then I prayed and it was awkward and stumbling, but I had some sense that, that God was with us in that place, in that moment. I said, amen. Uh, and Cindy asked, or, and Cindy looks at me, she goes, see, nothing to it. Um, a few minutes later, we had walked out and I, and I thanked her and we went on our ways and, and I didn't think again of, of the experience. Um, to me, I had just said a simple prayer for a guy who seemed to be asleep, a guy I had never met and I would never meet again. And so I was off to finish my, my you know, more important work for the week. And then Sunday came and I was here for worship that morning and another gentleman that I had never met uh, found me and he had tears in his eyes and he said, I'm Stan's son. I just wanted to say thank you. I can't tell you how much it means to me that you were with my father before he died. And I tried to tell him that I was only there for a moment, that Cindy prayed the real prayer. Uh, but it, it, didn't, it didn't matter to him. To him, someone was present with his father. I think about that for a second. So much of our healthcare is built around efficiency better outcomes, faster recovery, lower costs, improved technology. But when all of that fails, and when, when death finally comes, the best bureaucratic system has little to offer. Efficiency offers no comfort in death. Only love does. Only the presence of a person. And for Stan's son, the presence of a pastor was for him a reminder uh, of the presence of God. Bureaucracy can never replace one person being present with another. Bureaucracy can also never replace or reproduce the presence of God. There's nothing in all of life that compares to a human being standing in the presence of God. Of course, very few humans are capable of standing in God's presence when uh, it is actively revealed in uh, some of the ways that we find in scripture. Uh, Most of the time, if, if people have any sense of where they are, they find themselves on their face, kneeling, lying flat, humbly. I I, want to reread a bit of our passage in Ezekiel this morning. Um, Ezekiel 43, starting in verse 1, we find Ezekiel talking about his experience. Then he, um, you might remember from last week or what we've been reading, um, Ezekiel's been assigned a tour guide to show him through uh, this, this temple structure. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east, and, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. And the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. You may not know this, but... Um, for a number of years in the church's history, not, not our, the, the church, um, church structures, gathering places for worship were designed with the entryway pointing east as a way of anticipating 
the full arrival of God's glory. The vision I saw was just like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city and just like the vision that I had seen by the Kabar Canal and I fell on my face. Um, let me kind of get you up to speed. If, you, uh, if you've been reading with us in the book of Ezekiel, you know exactly where, um, you know exactly what Ezekiel, Ezekiel is seeing in this vision. But if you're visiting with us, if, if you haven't been tracking in Ezekiel, uh, the significance of this passage might, might not immediately move you. And so let me, let me try to get you up to speed. Uh, nearly 30 chapters ago in this book, 20 years ago from where Ezekiel is at right now, God had given Ezekiel a special uh, look into Israel's temple in Jerusalem. Ezekiel saw the temple of God and it was full of people. There was activity in nearly every room of this house. There, there was praying going on. There were sacrifices being offered. Worship filled God's house. All of the things that you might expect if you were to walk into a temple were happening there. And as all of this activity is going on, Ezekiel watches the glory of God making its way out of the temple. Out one door and then another. And then God's glory sort of, sort of hovers for a bit in the outer court where most of the people were gathering. But nobody seems to notice. And then God's glory makes its final move out of the temple. The Israelites will, uh, will worship in that place another five years before the temple is completely destroyed by an invading army. And the people will cry out, where are you, God? How could you let this happen? And God will respond, you're just now noticing I left? Throughout the, the story of scripture, uh, the glory of God, this, this phrase, um, is a way of talking about God's visible presence in the world. Um, God's glory led Israel out of Egypt as a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of uh, fire by night. God's glory rested on Mount Sinai where God invited his people to come and to draw near to him. God's glory settled over a, a portable tent we, we usually call the tabernacle. And, and, and God's glory moved with his people through the wilderness. And the beginning of Leviticus tells us that the purpose of this tent was to give God's people a place to draw near to him and meet with him. One of the defining characteristics of Israel, one of the defining characteristics, one of the things that, that set them apart as holy in the ancient world, one of the things that, that made their God holy and unique in the ancient world was that they had a God who promised to be near to them at all times. The God of Israel was unlike every other God in the ancient world in this way. He could be trusted to be near. His presence was never far off. Whether they felt it or not, whether they saw it or not. And yet Ezekiel watched in this vision as Israel's God picked up and walked out of the temple. But that wasn't the only vision that God gave Ezekiel at that time. See, Ezekiel was living far away in a foreign land, far away from the temple. And in this vision, God's glory, the very same glory that leaves the temple has come and has visited Ezekiel and the people who are living far off in exile. So God might have left the temple but he hasn't abandoned his people. But I, I, we probably need to say something else about why God leaves the temple. Because I actually know that this idea 
creates in people a, a fair amount of fear. If God's glory will just pick up and leave God's dwelling place at some point, and if we are the dwelling place of God, what is to keep God from picking up and leaving his people? Well, Ezekiel is going to announce that God will not only build a new temple, but God will come and his glory will dwell in it again forever. The temple was designed for relationship. It was built to be a place where God's people drew near to him. It was, it was designed to be a place where his people came to hear him and to speak to him. It was the place where they came to pray and to praise. It was a meeting place. The, the very first portable version of it was called the Tent of Meeting. This was its purpose. But it had become a meeting place where no actual meetings took place. See, the priests had created a bureaucracy in God's house where, where you could come and you could have an experience and you could feel close to God but never actually meet with God. You could come day after day and never recognize the presence of God in your midst. Um, there are these um, old psychological videos. You can find them on YouTube. Um, they're, they're from psych, uh, old psychological tests um, where, where you watch them. And the tester asks you how many times a basketball is passed between players. I don't know if you've ever watched one of these. They're amazing because you watch it and you count and you're like, oh, it's 17 times. And then the tester says, like, describe the dancing bear. And you're like, what? There was no dancing bear. Uh, and then they replay the video and you realize that there was a bear who danced onto the screen, stood in the middle and danced a little bit and then like danced off the screen and you did not notice. And you would watch it over and over again and be like, how did I miss that? But you never see the bear because you are taught, you are told to fix your attention on something else. And, and the temple was a place where people were learning to fix their eyes on their sacrifices. They were learning to fix their eyes on their actions, on their experiences, and their attention was so strong, so tightly fixed on, on what they were doing, what they were experiencing, that when God's glory left the temple, they never even noticed. They didn't even know how to identify God's presence in the first place. The temple bureaucracy served some important functions, but ultimately it would become about making worship efficient. It would, it would make worship highly emotional. It made worship feel effective, like it was accomplishing something, like it was getting God to act in particular ways. The temple bureaucracy was also really good at, at controlling people and their behavior. All the while, the glory of God just longed to meet with people. But there was nobody listening for his voice anymore. There was nobody who hungered to meet him and be present with him. And so the glory of God left the temple and went off to visit those in exile, those who were, who were open to seeking God's glory. Ezekiel announces in chapters 40 through 43 that, that God's presence will return to a house, a house in the midst of Israel. And last week we considered this house and we heard Jane make reference to this this morning, um, a house that's described in terms that, that lead us to sort of imagine it as this perfect 
place with perfect dimensions. It's symmetrical and square and it's holy and it's beautiful. And God gave Ezekiel a vision of a dwelling place among his people. And this week we hear what God intends to do with this dwelling place, that, that God is moving in, that this will be God's address, the place where we can find God, where we can seek him and listen to him and be in conversation with him. But far too often, we have a very particular uh, expectation of God. Um, we, we, we like to picture God along the lines of, and in terms of um, the, the powerful rulers or kings or even like dictators that we know of in our, in our, in our world. Um, yeah, God, he builds a house in our neighborhood, but it's, it's a big house so that everybody knows it's his. It's a mansion that towers over everybody else so that everybody knows who is in charge. It's a fancy house and elegant. It's mighty and majestic. And there he sits on his throne and he, and he looks out over his people and he rules them from on high. But this is not our story. The New Testament confirms that this is not what God is like. Even if the kings and powerful rulers of our world do this, this is not God's instinct. The New Testament confirms that, that the gospel of John tells us that in Jesus, in Jesus, in a flesh and blood human being, we have seen the house of God. It's a fairly vulnerable house as we know that our flesh is so vulnerable. But not only have we seen the house of God in Jesus, John tells us that in Jesus, we have seen the glory of God, the fullness of, of grace and truth shining from Jesus. If Jesus is the dwelling place of God, and God's temple is not some extravagant palace on a high, distant, and disconnected from people. Jesus is the presence of God having come near to us, walking among us, embracing us, being with us. This is who our God is. And so it's not a surprise that, that when Jesus comes near to people, every story we read of Jesus coming near to people, people discover their sins are being forgiven. They find that their lives are being made whole. They experience love and kindness and embrace and welcome all because they are experiencing God himself in the flesh. We, we want to picture a king exalted on a throne above us, sure, right? Like in the center of us, but up and high and towering over us, looming over us. But the gospels tell us that when Jesus is raised up, that his throne looks a little bit less like the thrones of tyrants and dictators and more like a cross. And the crown that he wears is bloodying his head. And we see the house that God dwells in, brutalized and bloody. Not only will he be with us, he will suffer with us. He will suffer for us. He will join us in death. God's presence isn't a distant presence. It is so powerfully close. And you can picture a presence that's near, but that's not close or accessible, right? But more and more, I am convinced that 
for a people who have so much bureaucracy that governs our lives, that orders, orders our lives, that in so many ways has value and is important, is important part of our life together, um, that the incarnation of God, the, the enfleshment of our God is one of the, the most vital, essential doctrines of the church for us to meditate on and for us to live by. Like it's so easy for us to think that we can love people from a distance. It's so easy for us to believe that, that, our, that our charity is the same thing as our presence. And I think we believe this because we don't have a picture, uh, we don't have a problem picturing God as, God as loving us from a distance. That, that like deep down, we have this, this picture of, of God as this like bureaucratic taskmaster out there making regulations and ordering our lives, but, but just distant and disconnected. That he's up there and maybe he's tossing out some blessings our way every now and then, but, but he's not near. Uh, many of you know that I'm fascinated by a TV show called The Good Place. Uh, I'm trying to only reference this show like once a quarter. Um, I might be failing. But the creator of the show openly confesses to, to not, not believing in a God or, or in the afterlife, which makes this show that much more fascinating for me as this window into, uh, into his view of, of life and the world and, and what this is all about. And as you journey with this guy through his vision of the afterlife, you can, you can understand why he'd be a bit skeptical. Ultimately, I mean, he pictures the afterlife, the afterlife that Christians and many other religions talk about as this elaborate bureaucracy. Um, just this week, so... Uh, they use, there's a scene in this week's sort of episode from a building that was, it was a, a bank building that was shut down in the financial crisis. The room is cubicles for like 300 yards. I mean, it is like the perfect picture of like bureaucracy. People typing away, Doing, doing their work, but there's no connection. There's no uh, relationship. Um, in his picture of the afterlife, people don't have names. They have numbers. Uh, they don't have stories. They have files. Uh, people don't have any sort of humanity. They simply have scores. And people aren't made to love. They just need to do enough good stuff to win, to get in. And there are, there are more nameless bureaucrats tallying your totals. And the system is like any imperfect bureaucracy. Uh, it's subject to tampering and corruption. It, it's, and so it's not fair or just, or loving. There's no dignity in it, or beauty, or relationship. It's like the DMV on steroids. And, and I, I really think this, that, that far too many of our neighbors, far too many of us, think of God in these impersonal bureaucratic, tally total, totaling ways. That if we just fill out the right paperwork, if we sing our songs just right, with just the right amount of emotion, that if we do more good things today than bad things, that we can get God to show up. Then God will meet with us. Then God will love us. Friends, this is not our God. 
This is, this is not the God who reveals himself through Israel's scriptures. This is not the God who shows up in Jesus Christ. Every time we turn our God into a bureaucratic overlord, we, we create this system where, where we are, are, are training ourselves to miss him. Last week we saw in Zechariah, I mean, think about who Zechariah is. Um, he was following all of the procedures. We're told in Luke that he is righteous according to the law. He's done all of the stuff. He's checked every box. He is the best bureaucrat. I mean, he was the very best of the system and powerful in the system. And yet when God actually shows up, he freaks out. Zechariah had become used to this impersonal system where you, where you just do the stuff you got to do and he no longer expects to actually meet with God in the place where God has promised to meet with his people in this temple. Like, but this week we heard such a different story. I hope you heard it as, as Jeannie read it for us. It was a story a lot like Ezekiel. The people were busy seeking God through bureaucr the bureaucratic structures of the temple and they just missed God. We saw this in Zechariah. And so God went and he showed up among the humble and the beaten up people living far off in this impossible land, this place where God couldn't possibly find them in Babylon. Well, in Luke, God shows up in the temple to somebody like Zechariah who could hardly believe it. But this week, where does God go? As far away from the temple as you could possibly imagine, God goes to this tiny nowhere village of Nazareth. And he shows up and he reveals his glory to a young teenage girl. God with us is supposed to be the description of God being with Israel in the temple. But instead we learn in this story that God is with her, a nobody. Nowhere in any of the documents, in any of the guidelines, in any of the procedures was there any possibility that God might show up to a girl like Mary. She was, she was out. Bureaucratic procedures had no uh, contingency plan for this. What happens? What happens when we become overly confident about the ways that God can and does show up? What happens when we forget? that God has promised to be present with us. And that he is already here. We can't afford to forget. Because when we forget, when we forget, we do the same thing that God's people have always done when they have forgotten. We draw away from the God who is always drawing near to us. Advent reminds us that God is coming, that he came first in Christ, and that today we wait for him to come again in his fullness. But Jesus said that until that day comes, I am with you until the end of the age. Christ has given us his spirit so that God might dwell in us and among us. And so we come to the table this morning, not to engage in some ritual that gets God to show up or something. We come to a table where God is present. And I just ask you that this morning as you prepare to come to the table, do you believe that this morning you're being invited to a table where Jesus is present and he is with us and he's inviting us to seek him and hear from him and respond to him and be in relationship with him? If our servers would come.